Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's proceedings. I'm um, Professor Jane Downs from the UHI Archaeology Institute, based at Orkney College. And um, it gives me great pleasure to say a few words about this splendid book before Nick goes ahead and tells you some more about it too. So the Ness of Bronga as it stands, edited by Nick Card, Mark Edmonds and Anne Mitchell, is the third volume in the UHI Archaeology Research Series. So it makes a really splendid addition to that series. The Ness of Bronga is a flagship, flag, flagship excavation of the Archaeology Institute an excavation which is going to be of such importance to Orkney, not only economically, which it undoubtedly has been evidenced to be, but to a whole range of people, from students, tour guides, schools, and Orkney visitors, to whom the site has become an annual highlight, sadly missed this year. An international audience for the NES has developed, who support the funding of the site, and avidly devour the wealth of information put out about the site. And I'm sure you all agree that the amount of information is really superlative and the access accessibility of the site through the website and now we enhanced through this fantastic volume. This book will feed the desire of many to learn more about this extraordinary Neolithic site. Documenting over 10 years of findings, the book is a testament to the ded dedication of Nick Card as director Professor Mark Edmonds, who drove the publication, and Anne Mitchell, the third member of this dedicated editorial team. It's never easy to prepare an archaeological excavation report for publication, and this interim statement is the result of huge amounts of labour in the retrieval, analysis and writing up of these exceptional findings. The many specialists who contributed their expertise and knowledge are drawn from the best archaeologists in the UK and further afield. Grateful thanks are due to them and to the Orcadian itself for all the hard work that has gone into this handsome volume and for the Orcadian support of the publication. I'm certain this book will sell well. It's eagerly awaited by legions of students, professional and amateur archaeologists and Ness and Orkney enthusiasts from all over the world. For the UHI Archaeology Institute, this is a proud moment indeed. Congratulations. Well, thank you, Jean, and thank you, Craig, for those introductions. Can everybody hear okay? Yes? Excellent. Um, well, thank you all for coming, not only because of the weather, but of course due to this extraordinary year that we seem to be living through. Quite surreal. But having said that, despite the fact there's not been any excavation this year, we've been a wee bit busy behind the scenes. Not only as post-excavation, you can see Roy Towers, Martha Johnson and John Blackford working away at Lockview, all socially distanced, all wearing the masks most of the time, but looking at a whole range of aspects of the, uh, basically here, the, the ceramic assemblage and also some of the geology. But we've been busy also extending the lines that you can now buy on an online shop and you'll see some of them at the back to give you some ideas for Christmas. Lots of lovely things, Christmas, birthdays, you name it, perfect gifts and everything. But also the publication of Landscapes Reveal, the kind of sister publication to uh, our own volume. And this looks at the geophysics program that's been conducted across the world heritage science over the last X number of years. But also looking at various aspects of the site in more detail. So doing stratigraphic analysis, refining, refining the history of the site. So here we see not very clear picture of one of the site matrices, kind of linking all the different elements of the site together. But most of our time has been involved, as Jane said, in the production of the Nessa Broadcom as it stands. And this has been quite an undertaking, uh, and it scares me to death thinking that this is just the interim. Uh, how many volumes will the final report take? Probably see me out of it. But anyway, Nessa Broadcom thanks all these different bodies, and of course the Acadian for publishing it. Well, the, the, the book, as it stands, is really the story of the Ness. And there's kind of several different strands to that. There is the kind of history of the Ness from, say, the 18th century, where the Ness itself is a kind of backdrop 
to these amazing prehistoric sites that we have, we're blessed with in all the stones of Stonesse. To the discovery in 1925 of the Broadway Stone, here we see it, it's now in the National Museum of Scotland with these very finely sized designs. To the discovery, really, of the nest through the geophysics program. And uh, yes, by that too, lovely comp complementary problem. And what the geophysics showed initially was that the tip of the Broadway Peninsula was just covered in these anomalies. Anomalies of every shape, size, and dimension. But little did we imagine that uh, this, what we've uncovered, was represented by this complex uh, set of uh, results. But it was that kind of uh, fate, moment of fate, when uh, Carol Horry's washing the dishes of the kitchen sink at Lockview all those years ago, 2003, when she noticed the tractor that was ploughing the field that all the Nani potato was stolen. Uh, and this large stone slab was pulled up. And this was really the catalyst for what we've done over the last 17 years, 16 years? A long time. I was 21 when all this started. <laughs> but from there, obviously, there was the excavation and the, the revealing of this amazing stone wall inside the structure, which turned into structure one. And the similarities with uh, Collins, uh, structure two of Barn House was pretty immediate. But since then, uh, our trenches and the investigations got a bit bigger. Initially, small test pit, right the way across the mine, 2004 to 2007. But since then, the excavation has got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> In fact, well, that's the size of it when we left it in 2019. And I can remember putting the, the covers or helping to put the covers back over, never dreaming that you know, it would lie covered for at least a year. Fingers crossed for 2021. And there we have all of the separate trenches. The main one is anyway Trench J, Trench P, Trench X, the one down there, and Trench T, the one at the tip of the Broadway Peninsula. And, uh, but still, it's always worth, worth reminding yourself that this is still less than 10% of the site that we've looked at. So if you think this little volume is an interim, and we had the chance in some dream world to excavate the whole thing, then we'd be there for many generations. But it's been quite an undertaking. But it's not just the story of the archaeology, it's also the story of the Nest community, the Nest team that's been built up over the years. And here we see just a few of the literally thousands of people who have partaken in the excavations over the years. This is just, I think this was uh, some of the Atlantic students here and the students from really at least five different continents. And it's kind of family that's grown up. Every year it's like welcoming back old friends. But it's also all the visitors, the public, who flock to the nest each summer. Averaging probably over 20,000 every few years, uh, over the last few years. And they seem to be enthralled with the archaeology as we are. Not only with the guided tours, but also the special open days that we have, the whole host of different activities that's put on. We see Hugo Anderson Weimar and his flint mapping, and there's a historic Scotland Rangers giving us a hand with guided tours. A whole host of different activities, which we'd love to put on again next year, but uh, we'll wait and see. But it's also the kids. We love to bring on the next generations of archaeologists as it's the excavation club. I think this photograph was taken a few years ago. Not only did I have colour in my hair, but I know some of these kids now, and they're all kind of teenagers that were at university. But also it's the behind the scene team. The whole host of volunteers that the nest seems to attract. And here we see Neil and Rosemary. Neil, unfortunately, is no longer with us about the McCancers and a whole host, some of who are here tonight. Thank you all so much, because without your input, the nest just would not happen. It's an amazing kind of behind the scenes uh, uh, army that we have, and a lot of them are kind of coordinated by Anne here. And we can't not mention the artists, the artists in residence of the nest. So it really became such a great part of what we do here. I think we've had somewhere in the region about 20 separate artists here, they're only here, and Karen Wallace, of course our own Jeannie uh, from Strongness, and Elizabeth, a, a German professor of art, but producing a whole range of different uh, art which records the nest in many, many different ways. It adds so many different dimensions 
to the way the message recorded. But the story that we tell in the, in the book is kind of so enhanced by the specialist input. And there's a whole, again, a whole army of specialists, PhD students, postgrads, etc., etc., but also world renowned experts like Kathy Bat here and uh, her studies of archaeomagnetic uh, evidence from the NES, along with Sam Harris, who was one of the first PhDs we got through the NES. And usually, archaeomagnetic uh, studies relates to, well, people think about dating using archaeomagnetic examples. But Kathy has expanded that to look at resource exploitation and also can give indications of how these, some of these buildings we use. And then, of course, there's Antonia from the New uh, York Institute, and her study, her chapter in the book, is kind of an amalgamation of that wonderful volume that was produced a few years ago. And uh, as you'll see, we have a thousand examples of Neolithic art discovered at the Nest now. It's just quite incredible. And some of it, well, you never can take a photograph that really does it justice. And Neil Ackerman's chapter on the roofing of the Nest, something which has really been unknown or unrecognised from any other Neolithic sites. But Neil's study included a lot of practical stuff and brought together in a lovely chapter looking at the way how some of these structures were roofed. And then Martha Johnson, another PhD from the NES, our own in-house geologist. Every site should have their own in-house geologist. Because what Martha has managed to do by looking at kind of the, the stuff that so often ends up in the spoil tip of so many excavations is to be able to extract a lot of data. And by looking at that, seeing how, we, how different rocks were exploited, not just from the locale, but from much, much further afield, right the way across all of them. And then there's the micromorphology uh, work by Joe McKenzie, looking at soil sediments and deposits through very thin, thin, thin section analysis. And what she's managing to show, as you read in the chapter, uh, is a whole range of things about how these structures were used, how their use changed, how their, their flooring changed, etc., etc. And this is kind of complemented by the work of Scott Pike and uh, Lara Shinsaku. Never get her name right. Apologies, Lara. But they have done amazing work on the XRF uh, material from the, from the net. And using his little kind of Star Trek type phaser gun, it's been able to kind of look at the way how different elements, chemical elements, are distributed across the interior of these buildings. And this is just one example. But by doing all the structures and having comparative material, then we can start to see how some of these structures, their use changed over time, and how different structures were used for different uh, activities. And again, this is even more complementary stuff, the work by Scott Timpany from the Institute, with the pollen and the environmental evidence through kind of studies of the charcoal, the kind of residues from the flotation systems. And the human remains, another UHI graduate, Andy Boyer, American, who's been looking at the very few human remains we've got from the nest. I know when we started excavating there and we discovered one or two human bones, we thought, well, this is going to be some form of mortuary complex. But apart from two uh, neonate burials, there's been very, very few kind of uh, uh, human bones in total. But even from that, Andy's managing to look at uh, distinctions, the way that these uh, bodies and bones were treated. So looking at different types of mortuary tracts. And of course, uh, Ingrid Mainland, uh, again, of the UHI Institute. And uh, Ingrid is uh, working with a team of others at the Animal and Bird Bone, and kind of looking at the economy, but also we're developing a, a new project using isotope and DNA analysis. So look at the way how cattle maybe moved around the nest or maybe came in from beyond. And although a much smaller assemblage than the animal bone, although I suppose fish are animals, is the fish bone and mollusk assemblage from the nest. This has been studied by another member of the institute, Jay Harlan, one of the world experts on fish bone studies. And uh, she seems to come to the conclusion that basically they were using local resources. But uh, some of the work she's done elsewhere would suggest that maybe there was deep sea fishing as well, even in the Neolithic. But a lot of these bones she's discovering are eel bones. And when you have the pleasure, as I've had, of watching some of the otters in the Lockhart's finesse, 
you all seem to be a quite plentiful. So uh, another little uh, insight into uh, the economy. And then nobody would excited to be complete without uh, stone tools. And again, very lucky that you have Hugh Barnes in my mark of the National Museum of Scotland, and Anne Clark, uh, an old friend, uh, who's looked at all the aspects of the, the stone assembly. So both the, the kind of core stones, but also the flints, and Hugo I got also had the pleasure of looking at all these beautiful mace heads that we've had. And some of the conclusions that he comes to, well, I'll let you read them for yourself in here. Maybe a bit surprising. And then the calf stone ball. Well, there's so much being written about calf stone balls, but see what's written with you. Fascinating stuff. But the pottery, well, the pottery is uh, fantastic. It's the largest assemblage of groomsware ceramics anywhere in Britain. We did a rough estimate for a project that we were going to be involved in, and we came to the rough estimate, so we had over 100,000 shards of pottery, which uh, was over a metric ton in weight to study. So Jan, who's here tonight, along with Roy Towers and some others, have been ploughing their way gradually through this amazing assemblage. And it's a joy to be in lock view with them because almost every day they'll come to me and say, look at this, look at this. Because it's only through this post excavation process that we get to actually see the kind of cleaned uh, uh, shirts of pottery. It's not always a chance to fully uh, expose the pot on site. But there's bits of twisted cord, there's colour, there's new types of designs. It's amazing the kind of variety of grooved wheel that we have in this, including uh, another first for British archaeology was the discovery of this little impression, which uh, is an impression of uh, textile, and this kind of complements nicely the kind of basket tree and kind of cord impressions, and this seems to be becoming more and more common as we look more deeply or more closely at the assemblage. But again, another aspect of Neolithic life that is so often kind of really just missed rather than kind of not being present. And we all, all have always spoken about the huge variety of material that comes to this, and really right the way across Britain, you know, mace heads, which probably came from the Western Isles, Shetland style, polished stone knife, amber beads, a landale, axe gland, and the Irish influenced art. And so, a couple of chapters in the book uh, relate to that, the aspects of the kind of wider Neolithic world. And we're lucky enough to kind of attract a couple of chapters by Mike Parker Pearson, famed for the Stonehenge uh, work he's done, along with Colin and Jane, but also Gabriel Cooney and Neil Carlin from Dublin University. And uh, they kind of put the nest into that kind of wider British and Irish context. Lovely chapters. But it's a story of the nest, which uh, is kind of the, the main emphasis of the book. From its early origins of uh, evidence from the Mesolithic through uh, flints, such as these, to the evidence for uh, very early styles of pottery, from under structure 14, this kind of early carinated bowl, uh, to other early structures, like structure 20, which you just see peeping through under the forecourt to structure 10, and uh, this structure, which has kind of been overlooked in the past, structure two, it turned up in one of the original trial trenches in Norman, the but there you can see, again, this kind of stall, using these upright stones, creating kind of recesses rather than the kind of later stone piers that you see. And then structure five, which uh, has all the kind of pedigree of being something very early, the kind of shape of it, very similar to, uh, say, the, the Brazer Harbret, the, 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 uh, Nap Power, that's his name I was looking for. Uh, but it's not just like a single phase of building. It's like all the other structures of the nest. They go through this whole sequence of development and change. And we can gradually plan it out. But it started off like that. They had various new entrances put in, new bits of walling, blocked entrances. But one of the most fascinating things that's came out of the recent post excavation is its relationship to the Northern Boundary Wall, or as sometimes referred to, the Great Wall of Broadway. Because we always, or at least I always imagine this to be a much, much later addition to kind of enclose the site almost when it was at its kind of zenith. But it seems that this wall 
was built at roughly the same time as structure five. So quite early on in the century, maybe around right about 3,300 BC. And about our own ideas about this whole enclosure, enclosing of the site as portrayed in this rather uh, almost romanticized uh, reconstruction of the the National Geographic, has been slightly altered because we now know that these two walls probably didn't enclose the site. The northern boundary wall with its external ditch, its later outer revetment, increasing its width, but also the southern boundary wall, can you see it is wonderful full height, almost two meters in height surviving just under the top soil. But these two walls now we think of it almost separate entities, maybe related but difficult to di directly uh, relate stratigraphically. But a lot of our work has been to unpick the overall sequence. So in Trench P, which so many people see and are amazed by, well, fantastic structures. Uh, it's a wee bit complex because we start off with a set of kind of quite simple peeled structures. And then we get something bigger, grander. And then later on, a bit grander, but there's a bit kind of almost backward stepping to it, followed by smaller structures. So we start to see this kind of you know, development of an S and how the, what this is reflecting and changes it in other sites and changes in society. But around about 3,200, I think we see the introduction of this kind of peered architecture, architecture using these piers as from the piers, creating kind of recesses along the sites of these buildings. And this seems to be a totally new idea that came in compared to those earlier structures from the Neolithic, like Structure 5, where you have these upright slabs used to create space. And it's very tempting, the early dates for this, I you think, we hope, around about 3,200, probably roughly coincides with the start of the roof here. But uh, I don't think, like anything else, that the Ness is that kind of simple equation, introduction of roof where it equals the introduction of peer architecture. But you never know. But some of these early structures are still being kind of just uh, exposed in uh, bits and blocks. It's like joining the dots on the structure 12, for instance, we have structure 28. But what remains of structure 8 is only little bits of walling and you're kind of very much joining up the dots and it's experience that some of our supervisors like Jim Ryland who's in charge of structure 12. That structure 28 was probably even grander, more refined than structure 12 that came later. And then structures 17 and 18, very, very similar in size, but underlying the latest structure 8. In fact, structure 17 was mainly uh, enveloped by and reused by structure 8. But then we see a total, another step change. But we see the monumentalization of these earlier period structures. And you get all these very well known structures that we see. Structure 1, structure 14, structure 21 just sticking out, tantalizingly disappearing under the first skeleton. And structure 8, the monumental structure, almost 20 meters long. And structure 12, uh, it's still one of my favorites, with its originally three entrances, but probably originally fantastic stonework, a lot of you know, pet stones, uh, beautifully laid out, very symmetrical. And then another one that tantalizingly disappears out of the trench edge, it's always so tempting to uh, wall chase, but the, yeah, there's limits, there's limits, there's got to be limits. It's tempting maybe to go out there and have a little poke around, but no, no, we resist. And structure 32, which is uh, uh, a later addition that's been bumped over the top of structure 5 in Trench G. And even beyond, beyond the walled enclosure, we now have another bit of walling which was discovered underneath the, the new parsing place outside the gate. And judging by the finesse of the, the stonework and the stepped foundations, etc., we expect that somewhere, if we were ever allowed to close off the Broadway Road for six months, we don't have a doubt that there'd be the remains of another beautiful pure structure. And maybe even beyond that, some of the geophysics that is, that's been done in just over the last three years uh, in the front garden of Broadway Farm suggests that maybe there we also have some other 
structures that relate to the net uh, will be banned from excavating the uh, by my wife. <laughs> but again, 2,900, again, you see another change. It's this kind of dynamic, moving society seems to be reflected in these changes in architecture. We see lots of changes, and here you can still see the outline of all those earlier pier buildings, but they're all changing. Structure 14 is remodeled, and a lot of the orthostatic divisions that originally divided it up were removed. The hearths were slightly moved over. Structure 1 was remodeled, the insertion from the kind of double cruciform shape, with the insertion of this big stone wall, much reducing the internal area. We've seen structure one, love that shot where it shows the preservation over a meter in height of some of these walls. And structure 12, again, is remodeled, but again, without so much care and attention as we see in the primary phase of it. And there's blocking up of a couple of the entrances, a new one created or almost punched through this end wall. And structure 8, this humongous building, which is basically cut in half. And the northern half, I think, remained roofed. And this is why we find the, the remains of this uh, slate horizon. But the southern end, the roof is taken off. It's probably possibly collapses, but they then clear it away. And this becomes an external work area, including this massive half. Probably the, the, the fires that this represented were probably too big to actually have inside a structure. So, you know, this seemed quite apt on this new open air section of structure uh, 8. But we also see other little structures being built. This one, I think, is structure 34. Yeah, 34. Uh, again, something strange, something weird. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's not one thing, it's not another. It's kind of what these multi orthostatic divisions within it, boxes. And, but there's almost no floor associated with this. It seems to be fairly short lived. But at the same time, we see structure 10 being built, this kind of monumental building, which I'm sure many of you have heard me talking about many, many times. This is probably the most wonderful piece of architecture in Northern Europe in this area. But perhaps accompanying that is also what's happening in Trench T. Because in Trench T, back in, or well, we started to uncover this amazing structure, structure 27, back in 2014, it started to come to light. But this weird building, which really doesn't have any parallels at all, now there is a kind of rough outline of it, but they use these massive pro orthostats, and orthostats, upright orthostats, cladding the whole of the inside of this building. Nothing else quite like it. Well, we thought there wasn't. But then we started to do parallels with the chain to Mithuki, where in fact one of the early structures underlined Howard Howe, which did seem to have she has certain elements. But Howard Howe is a very early structure uh, underlying another maze how type change too. But when we started to look at structure 27 in more detail, there's lots of elements that seem to suggest it's something a bit later, maybe kind of contemporary with the early uh, the early uh, structure 10, where the quality of the stonework is just a matter. It's a bit like structure 10, where both internally and externally there's something quite extraordinary. And again, you have this kind of pavement that runs outside the pavement that creates kind of step platform for the outside wall face. And although most of it has been robbed out, you can see there the quality of the stonework that survives. But everything about structure 27 is just amazing. Here we can see kind of end on some of the massive awful stacks on the edge, which are some of them are over four and a half meters long. And then divisions using uh, upright stones in the middle. You can see uh, again these awful stacks that can be held in place by these prone awful stacks, padding the whole of the inside of the building. But interestingly enough, this one, this stone here, which we now see side on. The end of it is decorated with incised decoration as well, which would seem to fit in more with that kind of later, not early, or early and Neolithic that we have. But again, the nest doesn't stand still, and the story goes that we see lots of different changes. A lot of these massive buildings got a use of place by you know, little federal structures. 
And the structure of ten perhaps goes through the biggest change of all, where a promise can be beautifully executed sub-square central chamber when you see the insertion of these kind of corner buttresses, and everything becomes just a bit shoddy. And this seems to reflect some of the other architecture inside the dates to this time, structure 26, which incorporates some beautiful stonework, but that stonework has probably came down from came from the robbed out remains of that primary phase of structure 10. And then structure 9, even smaller and more ephemeral. You can just about make out house and little bits of wall in here and there, kind of sub oval structure. But again, very little in the way of four, seems to be very short lived. And the same in uh, <coughs> Trench J, where we can see lots and lots of little bits of ephemeral work going on, paths, little industrial areas, or semi industrial areas scattered across the remains of structure 5, and in fact, going right out and, and uh, excavated into the remains of the northern boundary wall, such as these little bits of wall and kind of almost kiss like structure. And then it forms a kind of end game of the the Ness, the closure. And this is kind of, you know, there's lots and lots of different evidence, lots of different elements and the way different structures were closed by the structure 12, for instance. In the entrance, there was this slab been smashed, deliberately placed downwards in the entrance room. Beautiful thing, the, the so-called butterfly stone. Oh, there you see oh, And some of the structures finally totally went down in this, but so like structure eight, we, we, this is why we've got this kind of slate horizon. Remember, the other half of it out here became uh, roofless, but this northern half probably kept its roof until eventually the whole roof collapsed down in the south. But we also see closing uh, deposits, for instance, in structure 10. Structure 10 is almost revisited somewhere around about 2,500, but by 2,400, we see the, the deposition of things like this. There's a, an upturned cattle skull right in the middle of the half, and this large block of stone, which is quite covered in cut marks. But most famously, we see the structure 10 in the deposition, in this kind of outer passageway of the Isen uh, Group there, excavating the massive bone deposit. So this all seems to relate to the very tail end of the Neolithic. And accompanying this, we see some evidence, very little evidence, kind of Bronze Age, what should be termed Bronze Age, what could be termed Bronze Age. Just one or two shirts of potential eco that I think the jury is still out, so lots of different uh, uh, conclusions about what this shirt is, but I think it is probably some form of uh, eco, probably back to the pockets for us. But of course, classic early Bronze Age bottom tank area, sitting just above that massive bone deposit. But also more tantalizing perhaps is uh, from the infill of structure 26, that small building just to the side of the structure 10. And these two fairly what look like insignificant shirts upon, but these are fragments of a type of incense cup, which uh, there's only other four examples and they all come from the Stonehenge area. But the nest doesn't just end at the end of the beginning of the Bronze Age, because it still seems to be this kind of focus for activity right the way through prehistory, in fact, right the way through, you could argue, to the present day. But in Trench T, what we see is what we the initial geophysics show was kind of a collar running around the mound. And this has been shown by exploration to be this kind of probably late Bronze Age, early Iron Age, perfect ditch. Initially we thought we probably had a brock right at the top of this mound, this was in close and ditch. But the few shirts of pop I've had from it, very few in fact, considering you know, if this had been a brock, it looks like the ditch just the jam-packed full of uh, artifacts and elements. But very few, there you see, looking down sort of the kind of one side of the ditch that's subsequently been filled in with rubber. But this seems to coincide very nicely with uh, not only our geophysics that showed kind of concentric models of running around the mound, but also an early plan of the area uh, excavated, uh, drawn by uh, George Petrie and Henry Dryden back in 1857. And their little 
plan that we did is to stand on stones outside the House of Lord Purdue. And but the plan at the moment almost fits exactly the kind of outline of what the geophysics did. It's not quite an exact match, but it's good enough. But it might uh, say that you know, even back in the uh, mid-19th century, that this was a much more prominent feature in the landscape, and that this was maybe not a brook, but as we saw an excavate back in the days of yore, back at my uh, when Jane and myself ex excavated or directed the excavations of my Meinhard, but not only Meinhard, but the neighbouring site of Roundhouse. And there again, Petrie had drawn this, uh, what we find out, a, a ditch enclosing a possible brook. But the excavations that we did, uh, again, that produced very, very little evidence. And uh, pottery that we got from there was again late Bronze Age, very, very early on. So I don't think we're looking at brock, we're perhaps looking at a proto brock, but I wish Martin to others would see if could have tried. But the Ness, the story that we tell, goes right the way up through the historic period as well. And uh, including this, I don't know if you can make out this rune stone that was discovered back in the 1920s, somewhere on the line of Bronco Farm. But the Viking, uh, this rune stone, uh, also probably hits other forms of uh, Viking activity. Because the Ness, back in, uh, I think it's the, the saga of Olaf Tryggvason, refers to a battle, or maybe just a big skirmish back in the 10th century, somewhere on the Ness of Broadway. So the Vikings in the north did know the Ness. And in fact, Brodger Farm itself, although the main buildings today in the late time of the 19th to maybe 18th century, there is evidence that there was a farm at Brodger, perhaps going right the way back to at least the 15th century. And there's references to a, uh, uh, somebody called Brodger, who was a mercenary fighting in France. But then it takes us almost full circle, right the way back to the days of the antiquarian, the ways that the nest was over the last 100 and 150 years. These wonderful pictures by uh, Bryce Warlock and Painting. In fact, one of his pictures just came up for auction. It was coming up for auction. It's wonderful. Very tempting, but I do think the bank balance went to a stretch not far. And into the photographic age work by Tom Kent. Again, you can see here this is prior to the House of Lockview, prior to the little shed and the little blue house at the end of uh, the Broadway Peninsula, but you can still make out the standing stones that sit outside, but also the extent of cultivation going right up to the edge of the, the remains of the, the mound. Into the 1920s, we were start to see the landscape looking more like what we can see today. And full circle, as I said, right away back to the recovery of the Broadway stone. And close by where we think it was found, our own Broadway stone here, very kind of similar decoration. But the Ness, the book, everything about the Ness, could not be done without the help of so many people. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you to you all, because it's been an amazing experience over these last 10 or 15 years and uh, something which I'm sure will continue to fascinate and amaze for generations to come. But thank you all to all of our supporters, both past and present, of course, to different institutions, bodies, businesses, etc. But finally, a very special thank you to my two co, not two co conservators, co authors, co editors, that's so much. I'm Richard and Mark Evans. It's been great working with you and I hope that everybody enjoys the book as much as we did writing it at times. <laughs> Thank you.